Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event. Um, this is promises to be a very, what I would call probably one of the epic events that I've been to. Um, it's about best practices enabling hybrid cloud modernization. My name is Ernie Sampera. I'm the chief marketing officer and one of the co-founders of the exchange. I'm going to be happy to kick this off and be a moderator. For the next hour, we'll be talking about the importance of cloud transformation, including how to solve application modernization and migration challenges. We have some tremendous uh, group of speakers that combined bring over 100 years of experience in this topic. Um, I'm probably half of that, but I'll stay with that. We have Jason Rook, who's Global Modernization Program Lead Systems Integrator. Tremendous experience working with consulting firms and systems integrators. So if there's any good, I would say, if, if, if he's seen it, he's seen it all. And then we're ecstatic to have the founder of Cascadio, Jared Reimer. Not only has he been part of this industry evolution, but they've also um, a managed service provider. And recently they were the award winner of the Channel Partners Innovation Award. So good kudos there. And finally, Mike Rockwell from Megaport. He heads the solutions group. So he sees a lot of what goes on with his solutions architect. And he's bringing over 20 years of experience in this global um, carrier industry. So when you look at that, um, we hear from customers a lot of different pain points, and this is part of this webinar is to bring this experience, latency, cloud applications being developed, public, private applications in their infrastructure, IBM mainframe legacy apps. We hear the term repatriation of certain applications, value versus performance, control, 24 by seven support, pricing, budgets shifting, people migrating from their enterprise data centers to multi-cloud data centers or all of it on cloud, cost predictability is a big term, infrastructure, transparency, security, you hear. Commerce, commercial real estate decisions, what's happened over the last year and a half relative to this pandemic, work from home initiatives in terms of the strategies that have been implemented or being changed. The key is that all of this is occurring and it's part of this whole digital transformation. There has to be a total cost of ownership for this digital implementation journey. I recently read, and we will have a discussion with the panelists here. I recently read that the IDC recently predicted that by 2023, 73% of the organizations will have a comprehensive digital transformation and implementation roadmap. That's up from 27% today. So that's a major wave of innovation that's occurring, as well as a lot of work that everybody's applying here. Before we get started though, however, let me get into a few housekeeping notes to share. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A section. We will do our best to get to them by the end of the hour. Feel free to add any comments in the comment box as well. All our panelists will be happy to continue the conversation after the session as well, and we'll have, the connect, we'll have all the uh, information where you can reach out to us. To get this conversation going, we're going to kick it over to the audience for a quick poll. We want to get a better understanding of how you would like this conversation to go today. And with that, I'd like to pop the panel. As a reminder to the host, we cannot vote. <laughs> okay, give it a minute. Okay. This will help shape the conversation as we go through it. So please vote. Vote once, vote well. Okay. Do we have a tally? Yeah, we're at 25, I can go ahead and share that. Okay. Okay, 35%, I'm here to learn about the experts on potential bad practices that we should avoid. That's great, that's actually where we focused most of the expertise here in terms of answering that. And we will talk also technical breakdown of hybrid and multi-cloud future proofing. There'll be a good general discussion on that. So. It's great. We're going to hit those two top topics in throughout today's session. So that's good. So with that, 
what I want you to do is pull up a chair and listen to a, this engaging discussion, and we're going to keep focus on this whole poll. However, with that, what I'd like to do is also spend some time here, if I could, telling you, um, giving you a little bit of insight as to who we are. Some people ask, why is V Exchange doing this? Well, as a title, title state, we're maniacally focused on perfection. This is all related to security, reliability, compliance, all things that are actually intertwined with where this industry is evolving in terms of the context of what I've talked about before, the repatriation. What is key here is that we're driven to support our mission statement, which is a very simple, and that is protect our customers' brands. So who is V Exchange? Okay. We are a neutral colo provider in North America. We focus on these markets, whether they be growth markets for you, edge, or your local market, if this is where you're located. We have a choice with these on-ramps in terms of these data centers. So all of our being neutral gives you the ability to have the interconnection choice and then where and how you can um, enable this application journey. We also accommodate high density deployments. So we're engineered to do this in terms of this modernization journey. We're removing is some of the complexity of what needs to be done with the good foundational layer. We focus on what we do well, and it's all tied to location, location, and location. Again, back to we talked about before challenges of the application, the latency, or whatever that may be. We also have um, the, I think one of the differentiators is this focus on transparency, what we built and what we use to monitor, we extend into yourself. It's as if this is your own data center. So that's critical to that. And then service. Again, how do we do this? It's this all tied to this maniacal focus on um, customer and protecting your brand. We're centered on just our core competencies. We're tied to a strategy, one mission, as I stated before, protecting your brands, the MOPs, the SOPs, all of it, maintenance operating procedures for those who don't know who MOPs and, and then standard operating procedures. Everything is engineered for 100% SLA. Why do we do this? We do this with the Bell Systems practice, which basically is if we failed, we analyze the failure, we train, we improve, the, we improve to get you to this, um, again, perfection, building on the perfection. We're always on site. We are your remote hands, your eyes, your ears, your hands on site that has proven to be critical through this pandemic as what I would call some of the states and some of the local municipalities have shut down and only made essential services open. So this has proven to be a, what I would call a good practice to have. And then we also have a philosophy of zero trust security. We don't allow you in the facility. So if you think about it, there's a physical and logical security. You have a lot to worry about relative to all the applications and the stacks that go through that. And you're gonna hear a lot from um, the panelists on you know, some of the things you should be concerned. But the key is we give you that at least what I would call the barrier to entry to begin with. And then transparency. We treat it as if it were your data center. You're used to seeing what the performance of the app, what I would call the infrastructure, that's what we extend to it. And we have a strict adherence to this whole regimen of compliance. You can't, yeah, that is not a failure point for us. That is not an ability for us to have um, a, um, a failure. So the ISO 27001, the PCI HIPAA, just to state a few, you can check our website and we'll give you all the certifications. However, one thing we do do is we stay focused on enabling your agility through this journey. You're going to hear a lot of that with the panelists and the speakers. Stay flexible with the customers. Again, we started with um, a lot of the challenges and all the strategic initiatives that are going through there, but you still need to be flexible. So what is the key differentiator? One of the ones that we hear consistently is transparency is the key, and it's our application called Insight. What we've done when we built this company and we we actually said what we want to do is whatever we enable for our own measurements, whatever we enable for our own infrastructure, we want to extend as if it were your own data center. So essentially, it's a security blanket. It's an extension of your information for your services, power usage, bandwidth usage, compliance, asset inventory, cabinet layouts. What this platform has done, and we've heard from our customers, is, is that it's an overall enablement and it's structured and built around their total cost of ownership. It gives them failure predictions, power usage, capacity planning. Do you have any more use left in terms of the infrastructure relative to the cab deployment? Compliance reporting and attestations, minutes when you get the audit versus 
continuously asking for the information. And being neutral enables our data centers to be leveraged as a marketplace. Essentially, you look at this, you give the transparency, you give the neutrality of it, and then that's where you start to see this. In today's digital transformation, the complexity is enormous. This is what you guys deal with day in and day out, but it's still part of the journey. It's difficult enough to architect and build, but with choices, you have the ability to pick the best providers, and that's what we enable through the marketplace being neutral. So between dark fiber, MPLS, SD-WAN, we're going to hear from Megaport as one of the on-ramps. We have solution services. Once you do, you just interconnect to that, and then you can connect to the uh, what I would call some of these um, cloud providers that are out there. So, and then we're going to hear from AWS. So you're going to, these are all pieces of what you have to deal with and you have to architect relative to your modernization. The thing that we maintain though is, is that the reliability of the co-location providers, our analogy is a very simple one, but it makes sense, is whether you're B2B, B2C, whatever you build onto this Lego mat, if the foundational piece, which is the co-location is not robust, reliable, and um, part of the architecture of the choice, then all else fails. So in our world, everything is standardized in the data center. However, the sum of parts is what enables your custom solution. With our partners like Megaport, here are some of the use cases we can share. So we see this at cloud connecting to the cloud. Mike will talk more about that. Direct connect, disaster recovery, all the interconnection points. The key here is speed and simplicity. To us, it's just a cross connect. So you'll hear more of that coming from the Megaport tied to these use cases. This all points to what our customers keep telling us what we do better than anybody. And this is really tied to the Google reviews. I ask you to read them because it's important in terms of what that, what, what I think it's not what we say, it's what our customers say. With that, what I wanna do is um, thank you for the time and where you've given us. And I actually wanna turn this over now to Jason Rook, who's gonna talk about the AWS. Modernization. Excellent. Journey. Thank you, Ernie. Thanks for that. Um, I will go ahead and, and jump in here. Uh, just a quick check though, Ernie, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, well, thanks everyone again. My name is Jason Rook. I'm the Global Modernization Lead here at AWS. And, and what I do in this role is I work with our consulting partners across the globe to help them build, build capabilities to help our customers modernize with AWS. And so I think that's probably a good place to ask just what is modernization? So across our industry, there's a number of different terms depending upon what vendors you speak to and what solution providers you speak to. But here at AWS, we have a bit of a, a point of view on modernization and we've defined it as the process of progressively transforming applications and infrastructure to extend into higher value cloud native services that unlock new business capabilities while accelerating innovation and reducing technical debt. It sounds like a bit of a marketing definition, which it is. And what I think is most important to extract from this is the idea of progressively transforming. So with modernization, it's not really a milestone on a project plan or an end game. Customers continuously modernize. Um, and I think as they go down this path, what would they see is they see modernization and increased innovation and reduced cost. And that's exactly what our customers see as they go down a typical modernization journey. And most customers kind of follow this path, unless you're lucky enough to be a born in the cloud or digital native company with no existing assets or infrastructure, you probably have servers and applications that are running on premises somewhere. And most customers start their kind of modernization journey by simply getting those workloads into the cloud. Um, sometimes we like to use the term lift and shift where they take those workloads and kind of pick them up out of their own data center or colo and then move them into public cloud infrastructure. Here at AWS, we see customers take those into a technology or set of services that we call EC2. And when they do that, what they do is they start to get those applications running in the cloud and they start to fine tune them. They start to kind of prune their portfolio. They introduce some automation tools. They get to the point where they're kind of optimized for infrastructure in the cloud. And at that point, what we see is more customers that kind of then embark on more advanced modernization 
um, endeavors, if you will. So they start to really embed DevOps concepts concepts across their enterprise. They build rich CI/CD pipelines. They inter- imp- implement automation tooling. They look at big monolithic apps and they start to decompose them into more modern services, whether it's containers based or serverless architecture. And while they're on this path, what we see is is they increase the utilization of of innovative tooling, if you will, their cost of compute continues to go down. So good example of how our customers kind of follow this journey. And you might think, well, if I'm gonna embark on that journey, where should I start? And what we see, just to make it really simple, we see customers kind of start with classic applications, classic .NET apps, if you will. So I've got some .NET code that runs on an IIS server, and I've got, it's running on Windows, and my underlying database may be SQL. And probably everybody on this call today has one or two, if not many, many more of those applications in their environment. And you might look at that app and say, well, where do I take this? And if you think back to the where some customers start with the lift and shift, you may just choose to, hey, I'm just going to rehost this. I'm going to move it to public cloud infrastructure, and I'm going to go to AWS and, and put this in some EC2 services. You may take a look at that application and say, well, I really don't want to manage the OS or, or VMs. I'm going to containerize parts of this application and kind of deconstruct it and replatform, if you will. You may look at that application and say, wow, I really want to break that apart and use this and, and move to some more modern components. I might, I might take that .NET application and move it to .NET Core, which is open source. So I can do some really impressive things with it. I can use it, I can leverage it across, across Linux-based containers, right? So the idea of how you kind of break out that application component, you may look at the database component and say, well, geez, I really don't need to pay for that expensive commercial license, maybe I'll experiment with some open source database capabilities. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of our open source capabilities in in a moment. Um, You may say, I don't wanna pay for this entire huge commercial based uh, uh, database for just one component that I need. So you may move to more of a, a purpose built database. But the idea here is that you start with an application, you have these multiple pathways that you can follow. And so, I, you know, I started with this journey idea. This is just kind of a different view of that same typical customer modernization journey. But what I've done is I've layered on on the left-hand side here four more critical criteria, which are the infrastructure, the environment, the architecture, and the application. And what we see is as customers go on this journey, they start with the infrastructure piece and they see some value. And then they start to look across their entire environment and they start to pick out pieces where they can modernize and increase as decrease the innovation layer and also reduce their cost. Um, And then they look at the overall architecture and finally they get to a point where they're really addressing applications over and over and they're modernizing those applications. And what happens again, as they modernize and they innovate, their cost, cost of compute continues to go down. So to do this though, there are some building blocks that customers need to kind of get started. And I'm going to rattle through very quickly here today, just a handful of these that are, are important to all customers. I'll start with developer tooling. So I mentioned earlier about .NET applications, which are incredibly popular set of applications that customers choose to modernize. And you may think, well, why would I would do .NET in AWS? Well, .NET is a very first class citizen here at AWS. It was actually the first SDK that we deployed. And over the course of the last several years here, since 28, we've deployed, we've released over 275 instance types related to, to .NET. There are 22 different Linux-based AMIs that you can go grab that have .NET Core and or SQL included in those. So there's a really rich environment here at AWS for a .NET developer to really find their, kind of get their stride from a modernization perspective. You may also think about kind of that idea of compute and compute components and what am I going to really do to drive costs as I go on this modernization journey. At AWS, we've got these different options that you can choose from, from a compute perspective. You can, again, I I mentioned EC2, so kind of that infrastructure running VMs in the cloud motion. If you want to move on up to containers, or maybe you even want to go to serverless containers and have have a rich environment to manage those, or maybe you didn't want to get out of that, that business altogether and just use the core functions in the cloud that you need, you have all of those choices within the AWS ecosystem to kind of pick and choose what's right for your application and what's right on your modernization journey. Um, I mentioned containers several times, and I think what's important about this is just the sheer momentum that we see in the marketplace around containers. Here at AWS, you know, just at AWS, we've seen explosive growth, 450% growth in the container services that are utilized within our tool sets. 
Um, there are hundreds of millions of container instances that fire up every week here at, at AWS. So this container is motion. If you haven't stopped to think about where you're at on your modernization journey and what kind of tooling you'll, you'll look at, this is probably a place where you'll want to spend some time rather quickly. Um, I mentioned database earlier, kind of on that idea of kind of deconstructing an application and moving it through a modernization journey. There are really kind of two paths that we see customers take. And the first of which is to look at their overall relational database and say, I really want to explore an open source opportunity with this. And so we had, we had AWS, we have multiple opportunities there to do that. One is a product that we have called Amazon Aurora, which is um, a highly tuned open, open source based database um, that's really tuned to be as performant as anything that you would get from the commercial vendors, uh, but at one tenth of the cost. So a great opportunity to kind of look at how you might move a relational database to something else in the cloud. We also have this concept at AWS around what we call purpose-built databases, which is really the idea, back to the idea of you've got this big expensive commercial database, but you're only using a fraction of it. Maybe you're just using some reporting services or, or, or something or ETL or those types of things. We've got, what we've done is we've broken out some of those core popular functions that people use and we built purpose-built databases. So maybe you've got key value uh, concerns and you, Amazon DynamoDB might be an, um, uh, uh, an opportunity for you, or maybe you, maybe you're really interested in time series. So Amazon time stream might be a purpose-built database that you could explore. The idea is that you have a number of choices that kind of map to where you're at on that modernization journey. Beyond that, you might need some tools, some automation or some assessment tools, as we like to say, to help you get started. So there are a number of those here in the AWS ecosystem as well. So we've got a tool like that we call the replatforming assistant that helps customers take Microsoft SQL servers and move those from running on Windows to running on Linux. Some customers that embark on this modernization journey sp specifically focused on database really kind of struggle with how they deconstruct that database or even understand what's going on inside that, that database. So where do you have stored procedures? Um, you know, where, where's your, what's your schema look like within that database? So we have a tool called the schema conversion tool that helps customers really understand current state database and what future states should look like. We have this uh, migration service that kind of rides alongside the schema conversion tool that can either help a customer migrate or replicate to AWS. Um, well, from the more of a developer container perspective, we have a, a tool called App to Container that will help you containerize an application and move it to AWS. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's this massive momentum in the market from customers that are moving from .NET, .NET framework, kind of classic .NET, to .NET 5 and .NET Core. And so we have the porting assistant for .NET. And if you haven't realized so far, while the modernization journey is quite compelling for folks, especially if you think about innovation goes up, cost goes down, and all the other benefits that you get with that, you'll, you may have noticed that it's quite complex. And so not every customer has the skill set to just start on this modernization journey today. And so what we have here at AWS is thousands of highly skilled consulting partners, one of, one of, one of which is Cascadio. And so I'd like to just go ahead and turn it over to Jerry Reimer from Cascadio now. He can really help you to understand the real world experience that partners can help you with as you go on this modernization journey. So Jared, I'll put it, turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone's got my screen share and audio. If not, I hope someone will let me know. Uh, so my name is Jared Reimer. I'm the founder and president of Cascadio. I'm based in Seattle. Uh, Cascadio is one of the very earliest AWS consulting partners, and I think the very first uh, certified MSP partner by AWS. So today we're going to talk about thoughtful cloud adoption and lessons we've learned from doing over 100 of these over the years. Uh, Cascadio has been around for about 15 years now. Uh, I was the founder. I came out of the independent ISP and backbone engineering and data center and colo world uh, back in the dial-up and DSL era, for those who remember that. A uh, couple of things. First, uh, we are a little bit unique, so we don't sell licenses, hardware, software, we don't resell cloud, so we have no conflict of interest, meaning the only way that Cascadio makes money is by helping clients, and our job is to help the client, not to help the upstream providers or SIs or vendors. Uh, another key thing, we are one of the only premier consulting partners in North America. I think there are about 40 of them, uh, something like that. Very, very, very difficult to attain premier consulting partner status. Uh, requires a large number of certified engineers at various levels, requires a large number of successful client projects, et cetera, et cetera. 
We have these competencies. These are specific AWS programs that certify that we're uh, specialists in different areas like workloads, uh, Windows workloads, DevOps for automated deployment and configuration management, the well-architected program for ensuring that what gets built in the cloud is built correctly from a cost and security and scalability standpoint. And as I mentioned, we're also an MSP partner, so we don't just build it, we will operate it. We have an amazing book of clients, uh, some of whom you've probably heard of. I won't go through all of them, uh, but I will point out that some of these are Fortune 50s, some of these are really well-funded startups. One of them is a large nonprofit. Uh, we've done work for airlines, banks, uh, large telecom cloud providers themselves, et cetera. So enough about Cascadio, let's talk about what you're here to learn. Why do companies do this? So I think there's this big misconception that moving to the cloud is something you do once and that if you do it, all these wonderful things automatically happen and you can get rid of all your servers and data center stuff and life just magically gets better. And it's not quite that simple. So reasons why you should consider doing it, why people do it the right for the right reasons. First, if you do this correctly, you can reduce your costs in most cases by an order of magnitude or better. Now, that does not happen automatically. You still have to do the work to replatform around platform services instead of just moving VMs over. But if you do it right, this is really true, right? You can save a lot of money and you can save a lot of toil. So a lot of manual work that humans get paid to do, patching, backing up, manual DR, manual failovers, all these things that we used to pay IT systems administrators a lot of money to do, uh, as it turns out, just sort of go away if you leverage platform services. Another key, is that the cloud providers themselves, and certainly AWS uh, would be one of the absolute leaders in this area, have spent billions of dollars building the best security infrastructure, best operational infrastructure, best data center. Even if we had the money, the time it would take to recreate this body of work and this intellectual property is measured in decades. So it's not just a matter of money, it's that the money has already been deployed and all the engineering has been done, and as a result, uh, you can build on top of the shoulders of the giants and leverage all of this investment that AWS has made. A really important one, and most companies that fumble into the cloud get this wrong, is automation, repeatability, and consistency. So if you are deploying things manually, meaning you are hand configuring, hand clicking on the console, lift and shifting VMs, uh, you have not really solved the problem of automating your deployment or having repeatability in how things get deployed and having consistency across those deployments and how things are configured and operated, um, building on top of the automation frameworks provided by companies like AWS is the key to fixing this. If you want to be a little more neutral or agnostic, you can use things like Terraform or containerization that are a little less platform specific. But if you build on top of a cloud platform, as I mentioned, you get the benefit of all of this investment. Another big one, especially now, is scalability, flexibility, and being able to balance how much money you spend when you spend it and how much your expenses vary with your revenues and customer activity. Uh, in the data center, obviously, you have to make an educated guess and buy ahead of the demand curve. In the cloud, you can, if you do it right, you can have things auto scale up and down. You can right size. You can leverage things like spot instances that save a lot of money, et cetera. Another good reason, uh, security, governance, and business continuity, this is all much better in the cloud, again, if it's done correctly. And then finally, as we all know, because of the pandemic uh, that the world has changed, people just expect now that they can do their job from anywhere, uh, except in really high compliance environments. Now, why do some companies leave stuff behind? Number one, fear about security and compliance. Very valid fear and not for the faint of heart if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, there's also data sovereignty laws. So in the EU and in Asia, uh, some countries are uh, creating regulations that pretty much require the data to physically reside in their countries. Bandwidth, latency, um, data gravity, you know, how much is enough, like all the stuff around networking and around moving data and how much do we move and how much lives on premise and how fast. That's all a big gray area for a lot of people. And that leads to business risk, distraction, skill gaps, ROI, like all these things that are sort of scary unknowns for companies that haven't done this before. Another big one, and this is really unfortunate, is that most, not just many, most companies that we've talked to do not actually understand all of the dependencies and data flows between their different applications. And even worse, they don't have any proven ability to recreate the running system state. And by this, I mean, if their data center blew up they couldn't provably rebuild it to the same configuration it was in before the incident occurred, and that is very bad. 
as we all know, DR projects or DR uh, failovers rarely work in practice when they're needed most. But the biggest one is focus on the future. So this is really my uh, key message here. If you are moving things for the sake of moving things, you're probably not focusing on the future, your business, your product, your customer, and that's where the value is. So if you're going to move stuff, maybe we should be focusing on the things that are forward-looking rather than just saying, well, we're going to get a data center evacuation project done, shut all the servers down, and now we're in the cloud. So what does it mean to thoughtfully adopt cloud? First, why are we doing this? Okay, And if you can't answer that question, I would pause. Is it a tactical move or is it strategic? And by this, I mean, is it going to unlock some new business capability or revenue stream or customer experience or market for you? Or is it just keeping the lights on and doing the same thing you were doing yesterday? Uh, do the stakeholders have skin in the game? So who is responsible for this? Who wins, who loses, and how committed are they? Would you be better off just rehosting? Do you want to modernize something or do you want to build net new? Sometimes it is better to start over. Sometimes it is better to re-architect things that have already been built, and sometimes it's better to just simply move them or leave them where they are. Again, if you don't understand your current environment, and by this I mean all of the dependencies between applications, all the data flows between them, uh, all of the concerns around authentication and credentialing and how those systems relate to each other, if you don't know that you could rebuild it, uh, if you don't operate it through automation and deploy through automation, this is a skill that I would say you should adopt and build early rather than late. A lot of companies think, well, I'll get to that stuff later. I'm going to get into the cloud and then I'll do the real work. Don't do that. That, does, that never works out. This is not a one-shot project, okay? And it's a bad time for learning on the job. So it doesn't have to be us, but if you haven't done this before and your staff hasn't done it before, you should pick a partner. There are lots of them to choose from who have done it and have a methodology around it and have a practice around it, who can teach your folks how to do it correctly and then help them kind of get fly out of the nest and take it from there. This means commitment to investing in your team, might mean hiring new people, might mean letting some people go if they're not gonna make that transition, right? Not everybody is ready to do things differently because they're stuck doing what they've been doing for decades because it in the past has made them successful. And then finally, um, is this, a core competency or is it a distraction, okay? If this is not something that makes your business special and unique, probably you should find somebody else that is focused on that and pay them. So our usual hierarchy is if you can buy SaaS, software as a service, you probably want to do that. If you can't, you probably should pick a platform like AWS and build on top of the platform. The last resort is running virtual machines or physical servers or physical assets because those are the most capital intensive, toil intensive, and high risk, as opposed to uh, cloud platform services where most of the work is done by the provider. Is it truly unique to your company? If it's not, there probably is a company that specializes in it. Don't build your own trouble ticket system, pay somebody like Zendesk. Don't build your own chat system, pay somebody like Slack. There's no reason to reinvent those wheels. If you can't pay somebody to do it as SaaS, you probably should look at whether you can build it on serverless. So the AWS serverless technology is called Lambda. This is incredibly transformative, if only because it lets you focus on business logic instead of all this infrastructure and glue that connects everything up. And as it turns out, you can eliminate 90% of the cruft and glue underneath it if you just build this way. Develop, don't operate. Automate early and often. By this we mean uh, you should be deploying through automation. You should be configuring through automation. You should be exercising that automation framework regularly by redeploying manual operations, point and click, patch, update, redeploy through, you know, like rolling new binaries over the old binaries. This is an antiquated methodology that worked poorly in the past and works even less well in the cloud era. One thing you can do in the cloud uh, that's really special is you can limit blast radius. This is not just service outages, but also data security uh, incidents. You can very tightly isolate individual applications and very granularly control the data flows between them in the cloud in a way that probably was much harder to accomplish in the conventional data center. So operating in the cloud is different than operating on premise. Again, repeatability through deployment automation. If you can't get there, containerize the workload instead. Uh, IaaS should be your last resort. This means don't use EC2 unless you've exhausted all other options because EC2 
requires you to maintain the operating system all the way up the stack. And that's a form of toil that you can easily have the cloud provider take, take care of for you. It's also the most expensive because if you're running a fleet of VMs, you're paying for duplicate overhead, the operating system, the memory footprint, the baseline CPU workload. And if you containerize, you can factor a lot of that out. Another really important one that most companies that are not in tech do not fully understand is how much data sciences have changed operations. So some companies have monitoring, surprisingly, many do not. Some of them have alerting, but it's usually very noisy and it becomes the boy who cried wolf. Almost none of them have programmatic remediation. And this means if something is going wrong, the system heals itself or takes action to correct the problem rather than just paging somebody out of bed and having a human go in bleary eyed on New Year's morning trying to figure out how to fix it. Predictive analytics are huge. So with this, you can start to detect deviations in the system's operating activity before they become an incident or an outage. The best outage is the one that the customer never sees. If you do this correctly, you can detect things that are going astray, typically 15 to 20 minutes before an actual outage would occur. Rather than being reactive and responding to a failure that already has taken place, you are being proactive and detecting things that are behaving oddly so that the operator or the system has time to take action before it becomes customer impacting. When you do this correctly, you can build systems that are effectively, from the customer standpoint, 100% available, highly performant anywhere on the planet, easily scaled to whatever level of work is required, and constantly cost optimized around the actual workload and demand at that point in time. But this does not happen by itself. If you do the default thing, which is lift and shift, you get almost none of this benefit. So if you're going to do it, do it right and do it right from the beginning, because the old lift and shift first and then come back and take a second pass and then you do all the, the hard work uh, on a second pass, it never happens. What you end up with is a poorly optimized replica of your physical data center on someone else's hardware and the project typically by then has run out of budget and patience. So you can get all of these benefits. They are very real but you have to do the work. One of the things that people forget about a lot is networking. Uh, a lot of people try to do it over the internet. They do VPNs, they do open internet, uh, SSL. We think there's a better way. It used to be that you had to buy point to point circuits. You now can use cool products like Megaport that you buy one physical cross connect in your data center. And now magically you can get to any number of AWS accounts, vendors, partners, cloud providers, SaaS providers, what have you. These are all logical soft cross connects that can be built up and torn down very quickly. This is the future of cloud networking. Notice that the only physical you know, cross connect or kind of manual task here is this one time 10 gig or 100 gig link. Once that's in place, you can endlessly reconfigure all the rest of it in software. Another really cool product that I think doesn't get enough press and attention is Outposts. For the right customer, this is transformative because it's a subset of the AWS platform in a hardware kit that is pre-built, that is drop shipped and delivered to your colo. Uh, it is plugged in and powered up and connected to AWS through a backhaul circuit. And now magically you have the key AWS platform services running on premise. Uh, there's a flexible model around how you pay for it. You can pay up front, you can pay over time. It's a 36 month lease. After 36 months, they haul it away. And if you want another one, they'll give you a new one. This is really, really cool. And I think for a lot of companies, especially if you're a VMware shop, this is a game changer. You can plug it in, turn it on. You don't have to worry about complex wide area networking because it's in the same facility. You have unlimited bandwidth, zero latency, et cetera. And these are actually surprisingly quite cost effective for anybody with, let's say, um, I don't know, more than a few racks of scale. Finally, I'll, I'll pitch the uh, Cascadio.io platform. This is a free tool that we provide to our customers and to the world at large that gets you most of the benefits that we talked about around AI and machine learning assisted infrastructure operations, monitoring, predictive analytics, all of this uh, built right in as SaaS. So you can go to the Cascadio.com website, you can sign up. And if you have questions about this, we're happy to help you. We can do guided onboarding. We can do customizations. So if you have legacy monitoring tools that you want to integrate, for example, uh, we're happy to integrate those. This is built on years and years of experience and millions of dollars in investment in essentially the application of modern data sciences to infrastructure operations, both in the cloud and on-premise. So in conclusion, number one, 
You need to get good at operations. Operations are different in the cloud. If you do them correctly, you can do every aspect of infrastructure operations better, faster, cheaper, more reliably. Note that we have a free SaaS tool that we're offering everybody here to give a try. And if you have questions, let us know. If you embrace this kind of tooling and technique, you don't have to use our tool. There are others out there, but some sort of AI ML assistant infrastructure operations, you can avoid disruptions and incidents by getting ahead of the curve rather than being reactive, rather than waiting for things to fail. You can detect when things are about to fail. You're not gonna catch a power outage or a fiber cut, but most outages in IT are memory leak, runaway process, disk fill, something, you know, DDoS. They're things that are not physical world problems. It's very good to catch these before they become outages. Business agility is king. So you need to divert investment, investment away from stuff that's going away, things that are being sunset, and refocus that limited investment of time, money, headspace, engineering cycles, business, uh, in, put that into the future. What makes you special? What makes you unique? If it's not special, if it's not truly unique to your business, you should probably just buy SaaS because these days you can buy SaaS for almost anything. And in almost every case, it will be better, faster, cheaper than doing it yourself. If you can't, build on top of a platform. I happen to think AWS is a fantastic platform. I have a background in computer science and engineering, and I would say is one of the most transformative things in the history of computer science. Uh, but any platform will do. Pick one and get good at it. Uh, you know, don't, don't run IaaS if you don't have to. So that is in a very brief form. How we look at the world of thoughtful cloud adoption. I'm now going to hand it off to Mike Rockwell from Megaport. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jared. And uh, I know we're getting uh, towards the end of the presentation here. So luckily I am wired and hybrid cloud inspired. I will try to get through uh, my presentation here in about 10 minutes because we definitely want to answer those uh, questions that you have. But um, you know, as Ernie mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, my name is Mike Rockwell and I am the head of solutions for North America with Megaport. Um, and you may be thinking, where does Megaport fit in this discussion? Well, uh, you know, Jared talked about it a little bit, but, you know, Ernie outlined uh, building that modern data center uh, environment with VXchange and Jason did a great job talking about how you can modernize your applications with AWS. And Jared really, uh, you know, gave a great presentation of how you can, uh, you know, decide where you want to put those applications or the thought process in building on-prem and cloud environments. You know, Megaport really fits right in, in the middle of that uh, data center and cloud experience, providing private connectivity to support your, your hybrid cloud deployment. So I like to really call us that, uh, you know, network connectivity glue uh, that really, you know, provides that optimal performance of uh, connectivity from the data center into the cloud that you choose. You know, oftentimes uh, the customers that we work with, they've built out, you know, these great uh, data center environments. They've also built out, you know, bulletproof uh, cloud environments, but they haven't necessarily thought about uh, that network connectivity of how they're going to support those hybrid uh, workloads. Um, so typically, you know, customers, if they haven't thought about private uh, connectivity, they may have, uh, you know, just simply set up VPN tunnels over the internet and found that those, you know, there's security concerns there, but then, you know, there's also the performance uh, concerns, there's, there's throughput issues. Um, typically, they're gonna have some type of issue in supporting those hybrid applications and routing over the internet through those tunnels. Um, so that's when they start to turn to uh, private connectivity if they haven't thought about that before. And that's really where Megaport fits into uh, the conversation. We've really modern modernized uh, connectivity. We've moved away from, traditional carrier type of architecture where I'm stat turning up static point-to-point -point links to end locations, whether that's from my data center to maybe one cloud provider, or my data center to another cloud provider. We've automated that process just like the cloud has automated uh, workloads for you outside of the data center. So now customers can utilize the Megaport network as we're a global network as a service provider to provide uh, that private layer two connectivity via a software defined networking platform that really makes it easy for customers to order, provision, and scale their services on demand. So very similar to how I build out my cloud environment, I can now modernize and build out my network connectivity through a provider such as Megaport. So I'm real high level, quickly gonna talk about you know, Megaport as a whole. Um, we have over 2,100 uh, customers today. So we've been in business for eight years, very well established. You know, we work across 105 unique data center operators, and v, v Exchange being you know one of those uh, premier data center operators. 
but you know, we are data center neutral and we are global. So once a customer, once one of these 2,100 customers have connected to us in one of these data centers, they have access to a global platform. So whether I wanna turn up a, a connection to say AWS, or I wanna to connect to Azure or, or GCP, whatever the case may be, once I'm physically connected in one of, one of our data center locations and we're enabled in over 700 across the globe, I'm now able to easily turn up that connectivity. I can scale it up and down. So anyone who's been turning up network services or turned up workloads in the cloud and also hosts them on-prem knows that those can be very, very variable over time. They grow, but you know, there's instances where maybe I need to also turn up a, a connection for a short term. I need to work with a provider that allows me uh, the ability to turn up these connections on demand. We also support multi-cloud connectivity. So we'll talk a little bit about hybrid and multi-cloud architecture that you can set up but we have a virtual router that allows our customers to route cloud to cloud over our private platform. And it's also private and, and secure, right? So we're not routing any traffic uh, over the internet. We're providing a, a private layer two service. So a customer is gonna turn up a private connection through Megaport from their data center to the cloud provider. They're gonna manage that routing relationship with their private environment that they've built in the cloud. And we also offer flexible terms. So nobody wants to get locked into a, a three-year contract when they know that it's gonna change. Um, so outside of that kind of traditional carrier uh, portfolio of taking down, you know, multi-year terms where I just have a static connection, you know, we offer flexible terms. So you're going to want to work with a provider that has flexible terms um, that you can turn up and turn down services you need it. So we do have over 365 service providers. We've got all the, the great Hyperler scalers that we all uh, know and love and work with today. So AWS being the, the premier partner on this call. Uh, customers can turn up uh, connectivity on our platform literally in a matter of minutes to any of these providers. We built out that physical network underlay, but we've also incorporated API integration with the cloud providers so that turning up network connectivity is automated through uh, our platform and through our customer facing portal. I do want to highlight the exchange, uh, our partner on the call today. So we physically deployed the Megaport network in seven V exchange data centers that are listed here. And why would that be important to a data center customer? Well, the cloud provider edge doesn't always necessarily sit in every data center across the globe. In fact, they sit in, you know, really very few data centers across the globe. So I have to have the ability to connect in one of these V exchange data centers. And I can, once I connect to Megaport, I have access to the global Megaport fabric. I can instantly turn up a connection to AWS. I could turn up a connection to Azure. I could turn up a, a connection to GCP. And I can do that at the optimal location uh, at the cloud provider edge. So that could be probably closest to the uh, cloud provider edge, closest to the customer's data center location. Um, but sometimes customers are gonna wanna also build out redundancy and they're gonna wanna build out geographical diversity and connect to an edge location that does not sit near uh, their data center. But where Megaport really fits the bill for that is we've built out over 227 cloud on-ramps. And I really think that's amazing because our competition can't touch that across the globe. So there's certainly other providers that you know, have connectivity regionally, but nobody has a global scale like Megaport does. And you know we all work in a global world here today. So 227 on-ramps, typically customers, when they connect in their data center, they're gonna, gonna wanna connect to the closest on-ramp to get on the cloud provider network ultimately to reach the region of their choice. So through these on-ramps, our customers, uh, through the cloud providers can reach any one of the regions that you see on this, uh, this slide here. So great reach. That is an important thing that you need to think about. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a, a couple of solutions. I don't have time to get into every single architecture that uh, we can support with Megaport. Um, we're certainly happy to talk further with you uh, post webinar, but I'm gonna go through a few options and you can really see how you can build hybrid and multi-cloud solutions that can support, you know, really all of your hybrid network connectivity needs. Um, so one of the things that is important as you look about modernizing your network, you wanna have a, a customer facing management portal that allows you just like you do with AWS to go in and, and automate your services or even automate it through a, an API. You can do that, all of that with your network services through Megaport. So I don't have time to go through demo, which is surprising because I could turn up all these services that you see here on this page in probably like 10 to 15 minutes and you'd actually be routing between your data center and the cloud once the cross connects in place. But I don't have that much time. I've got like three or four minutes left here. So just to give you an idea of what our portal looks like, this is a, a picture of it. If I wanted to create a port, a one gig or 10 gig physical connection to our router in the Austin data center, 
I simply would just click on create port, uh, select that V exchange Austin, Austin or awesome data center uh, in Texas. I would instantly get a LOA CFA, so a circuit facility assignment where V exchange would run that two fiber cross connect. Now, literally once that's in place, I can click on plus connection. I select AWS and I'm instantly able to set up, uh, you know, private VIFs, transit VIFs, public VIFs to AWS through a direct connect type of scenario. So private connectivity via Megaport, customers setting up their routing relationships, since this is all layer two on the Megaport platform, they're setting up a BGP peering relationship with their environments in AWS. So when we talk about AWS, one of the, the leading premier partners, typically a lot of our customers uh, will go multi-cloud. So they also want to have to really future proof their network and have the ability to connect to other cloud providers, right? So I may be working with, or one of our customers may be working with AWS today, which is awesome, but they may have the, uh, the need to turn up a workload within Azure or GCP or any other provider on our platform. They can instantly do that by going through the portal and adding that connection to those providers and managing those pairing relationships. So this is kind of our standard or what we would see as a, a standard hybrid uh, private connection from data center to cloud. Now let's talk a little bit about hybrid and multi-cloud. So another great thing about Megaport is we offer what we term as the MCR. It's a virtual router. You can essentially deploy it anywhere across the globe. So it's, instead of deploying infrastructure at the edge of the cloud, where maybe you want to route cloud to cloud, you can deploy a virtual instance with Megaport, but then also route back into your data center through the Megaport network. So where this really comes into play is, you know, everything's about latency and performance these days and supporting these applications. So if I have workloads that need to support, be supported both by AWS and Azure, I could set up an MCR in the region um, closest to the cloud provider edge and the regions where I'm working with the cloud providers. So for instance, I have this Austin data center, I could deploy this MCR in Northern Virginia. Um, I could then directly connect to AWS, I could directly connect to Azure and directly connect to GCP. I can route, manage those routing relationships so all the peering relationships can be managed through the MCR and I can also manage a route back into my data center. But what this does is it offloads hairpinning all the way back into Austin, keeps my traffic local, within uh, Northern Virginia and allows me now to route from say AWS in US East one, Northern Virginia to GCP US East four in Northern Virginia and have a latency profile, hard to believe, but through the MCR between those two regions of roughly about three milliseconds. So, you know, if you need a low latent connection between the cloud providers, MCR is a way to support or a virtual routing option is a way to support uh, cloud to cloud connectivity. But now I also can manage those routes back into the data center and access my applications or workloads within the data center as well. You know, diversity and redundancy, you're always gonna be top of mind uh, for any customer. So we really kind of break this down into, uh, you know, three parts. The first part is where you physically connect to your network service provider. So we'll take V Exchange as that example again. In this particular scenario, the customer is setting up their resiliency out of their, their WAN into the cloud through two different data centers. So I can connect through Austin again. I could also connect potentially through, say, via Exchange in Santa Clara. I probably have workloads then that are sitting uh, with the cl cloud providers in the US West regions. I can build mirrored uh, layer two connections through Megaport from each one of those data centers. I can also build um, through Megaport's private backbone, I can build a point-to-point uh, -point service between my two data centers with VXchange. So if I wanna offload some of that traffic off my WAN, move that, that data between data centers over the Megaport connection, I can do that as well. So you wanna figure out first, how are you supporting um, diversity at the edge in your physical connectivity? In the middle, so when I say in the middle, I'm talking about the core network connectivity between your data center in the cloud. Megaport, this is all layer two connectivity. So we've built out infrastructure and redundancy so that if any one of your uh, links, uh, a fiber cut, say a fiber cut occurs on the link from A to B, it's rerouted to the second path path. So all of these, what we would term as VXEs or layer two private connections off of your ports into the cloud, they are protected. The other thing that's great about having as many on-ramps as Megaport does, is that we do give you the ability to build those high availability and SLA supported uh, connections with the cloud providers. So with AWS, I could connect in two different edge locations. With Azure, they support uh, an SLA and resiliency redundancy with the express route where I could connect to router one and router two. 
I can also do that with GCP. So I can support a 99.95 SLA through Megaport with Azure. I can also support you know, both of the SLA criteria with Google that I won't get into here, but they just have a 99.9% .9 uptime SLA and a 99.9% .9 uptime SLA. All that can be supported through the Megaport network. So you want to have a, a service provider if you're going to modernize your infrastructure that's automated. You also want to have someone that has the reach. And that's where you know, we know that Megaport fits the bill. I'm going to go through this real quick because I know we're running out of time, but you know, really the whole purpose of Megaport and how we were founded is we wanted our customers to be able to um, consume network services the same way that they consume their cloud services, right? So that is all on demand and at your fingertips. You can talk to me as much as you want, and I love to talk to our customers, and I love to talk about architecture and design, but at the end of the day, if you want to turn up a Megaport service, you don't have to send me an email. You don't have to send me an order. You go into your own account and you turn it up and you use it how you want. Um, and that's what I love about working at Megaport because you know, that's really what our customers are looking for. And it's all you know, at their fingertips and easy for them to uh, you know, deploy. So uh, I think I will leave it there because I'm guessing that we are running out of time and I'm going to pass it over to Ernie to finish the Q&A. Thanks all for attending. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I just want a quick reminder. And um, Jared, thank you for sending a note out to everybody. If you have any questions, I see there's a couple of them. And let me go to <clears throat> the first one. Well, that one's pretty easy is it's directed at me. So what I mean by zero trust, um, let me kind of go step back. If you're not granted access by your the, the authoritative power that you have been designated as a customer, you will not get into the data center. So essentially everything is validated against a list of um, authorized users that you allow in there, whether they be third-party suppliers or even all the way down to employees. And all of that is monitored real time on time. Hopefully that helps um, clarify that. The second question here is for you, Jared, as it refers to hybrid cloud, do you help customers decipher what to put in a cloud versus what the host in a data center? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and it's not one with an easy answer because the answer will vary by the client. So some customers have the idea that they want to move everything into the cloud as part of their larger strategy. And that's a completely reasonable thing to do in most cases. Some customers have extensive investment in hardware and infrastructure in the physical world that still has a lot of residual life left in it and they've got a well-tuned, well-operated, cost-efficient physical data center, it might make sense to wait or not to move some things. Um, usually the right answer is to de determine the dependencies between applications and databases, and then to move groups of them. So typically what you'll find is that there are some small number of apps, three or four apps or something, that are fairly tightly coupled and related and then they are very loosely or not at all coupled or related to other clusters of applications. There are tools that you can use to suss this out and figure out which apps really need to be moved together. Uh, those same tools can often do some cost and capacity forecasting. What is it going to cost if we move it? Now, those cost calculators are not perfect, but they give you a rough order of magnitude estimate of the operating cost. And then another one is, is networking, right? So if you don't have a lot of bandwidth in or out of your data center and you need, and there's no easy way to get it, that's a different scenario than if you're at VXchange and you have Megaport where you can effectively dial up the bandwidth and dial it back down on demand, right? So there's lots of variables. Uh, yes, that's a big part of what we call discovery and assessment and cloud migration planning. Typically for us, that's the first customer engagement is what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What needs to move in what order? And why, like, is it worth moving or should we just leave it be and let it run its useful life out and then sunset it? And there's no right answers to those questions. Like a lot of companies say, <clears throat> we want to move everything to AWS lock, stock and barrel. And we'll say, okay, great, let's do that. There's a completely valid and appropriate argument for that. But not everyone has that luxury. Not everyone has the bandwidth of the headspace for that. So yes, we will be happy to help with that. And uh, you know, if you wanna chat more about that offline, uh, you can contact info at cascadio.com. Great, Jared. Thank you. Um, I see. Uh, here's another question. And um, and I'll just I'll read the question and then someone could raise their hand or 
at Respond. How do you mitigate single point of failure risk in a hybrid cloud scenario? Who, who wants to touch on that? On? Okay. I can touch on that. Um, okay. So in a hybrid cloud scenario, I think, you know, I really like to build it into what I call three zones. So one would be the data center side of it. So you've got to look at your WAN and how you've built in uh, diversity from your WAN um, to the cloud. So typically, like a lot of our customers, they're looking for uh, dual connectivity out of the data center to the cloud provider. So you want to first look at the data center edge of your network and figure out, do I want to connect through multiple data centers? Do I want to connect through one data center? Do I want to look at two providers? And you want to find a way to where you're going to set up two physically diverse connections within that data center to access um, the carrier that's ultimately getting you to the cloud. You know, across the core, if you look at, uh, you know, a company like Megaport, if you're getting a layer two connection, then typically those, uh, you know, logical connections off of those ports or pseudo wire ethernet connections to the cloud provider edge, those are, are fully protected. Um, so typically that's the type of thing that you would see in a, a private layer two connection. At the edge of the cloud providers, typically the cloud providers are gonna recommend uh, two to four physical connections at the edge of their network to support you know, high availability and then you build in the resiliency with your routing. So you're gonna to wanna to look at the, the edge of the cloud provider network. So one, you could connect to the cloud in two different uh, geographical areas or two different markets or they have options where you can connect to them in, in different zones within the same market. So there really are numerous ways that you can build in diversity and then you can support redundancy through your routing. Um, uh, but uh, you know, really you kind of want to look at it in three segments in my view, from the data center, from the core of the provider network to the edge of the cloud provider network and make sure that you have that physical diversity and then the redundancy built in with your routing. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I got, I had it. There's a, it looks like it's a follow up question here, real quick. Um, and this one is for you, Mike. Uh, do you integrate last mile to my colo or on prem? Yeah, so, I mean, we actually have the ability through uh, what we term as our, our MVE or a Megaport Virtual Edge. I didn't touch on that today, but we launched it about a month and a half ago. So our customers are now able to deploy Virtual Edge on their SD WAN networks with Cisco, VMware, uh, and Fortinet and then aggregate traffic through the internet back into the Megaport pri private network and utilize that Megaport infrastructure underlay and then overlay their uh, SD-WAN on top of Megaport. So that is one option. If you wanted to have private connectivity, say from your, your private data center into, uh, or on-premise data center into a data center that Megaport's ultimately deployed in, um, you would have to look at getting a point-to-point -point connection from that data center uh, into an enabled Megaport data center to ultimately connect to our network. and. Uh, we can certainly, you know, we have partners that, uh, you know, do that, uh, would do that for you, but, uh, you know, we don't procure that piece of it. Um, I think there's several questions popping up. What I'd like to do is we'll probably um, forward them to the panelists and go from there. I want to be truthful to everybody's calendar here. So that's probably all the time we have for questions. We've run a little bit over. Um, so, but definitely follow up with the email and then we'll kind of, we'll chase it down with you guys. I also want to announce that through the 25th of June, if you schedule a virtual tour or a live tour with one of our data centers, we'll give you a hundred dollar gift certificate. And we do that as thank you for, you know, having lunch or dinner on us. But most importantly, I want to thank our speakers from AWS, Cascadio, Megaport. I'd like to close this event by thanking everyone in the audience for taking time to join us today. Great questions, great time. As you see over hundred years of experience here with stuff to put it in one hour, but, um, Look forward to seeing the questions and we will, um, you know, keep chasing us down for some of the questions. And if not, we'll follow up and answer them um, as we get them as well. And I want to make sure that everybody stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.